<clears throat> hey, everybody! Mr. Cruz here to talk to you about bonding. No, not family bonding where your mom makes everybody sit at the dinner table. I'm talking about chemical bonds, the stuff that holds us all together. Without chemical bonds, we would just be atoms floating through space like Spider-Man after the snap. So what I got here up on the screen for us are a few questions about chemical bonds that I'm going to try to answer. And then after we get answers to those questions, we're going to look at how we can model chemical bonds and draw them so that we can communicate with each other about what a compound looks like and what it's made out of. Ooh, I just used a word that maybe you haven't heard before. Compound basically something that's made out of more than one element. I would write that down if you didn't know it already. <clears throat> so, what is a chemical bond? Well, if we look right here, it's when two or more atoms tightly link using their valence electrons. I told some of you guys valence electrons were gonna stick around, they were gonna be important, and this is why. Valence electrons are the electrons that are involved in bonding. Whoa, 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 Mr. Cruz. So you mean to tell me that I have to remember the stuff from the last unit where we had to count across the periodic table to find the number of valence electrons? You expect me to remember how to do that. Yes. You see, when atoms form a bond, it's not as if they both walk up to one another and decide to link up. They're bouncing around in space, and sometimes when they knock into each other, they stick in a special way that we call a chemical bond. And because valence electrons are those electrons on the outside, it's those that are going to come into contact with each other. So we gotta know all about valence electrons if we want to talk about chemical bonds. More on that later. For now, I want to talk about what different kinds of chemical bonds they, there are. I want to answer this question right here. There are two types of chemical bonds. We have covalent and we have ionic. Covalent bonds share electrons, whereas ionic bonds transfer electrons. And I've got this nice little GIF here for both of them. But let's zoom in in some detail to look at what happens during each of these different kinds of chemical bonds. Okay, so I got the full screen version of that GIF that you saw at the bottom of that flowchart. Let's take it slow and look at exactly what's happening between the atoms that bond in that GIF. Remember, this is a covalent bond. Electrons are shared. Okay, so just taking it a frame at a time, we see these two separate hydrogen atoms right here. You know that it's hydrogen because there's one proton and one electron in each one of these. <clears throat> now what we're going to form is called H2. It's a molecule made of two hydrogen atoms. That's why we call it H2. So as they come together, they bump into one another and then wham they stick and when they do you can see how this bond is made this bond is made where they share these two electrons that is a covalent bond let's watch it again with hydrogen and oxygen ah so see we have our hydrogen <laughs> pointing at the screen like you can see uh, I'm, I'm point, uh, I have the hydrogen atom right here, one proton, one electron, and right here I've got an oxygen atom. It's got eight protons in the center, and then it has eight electrons on the outside, but only six valence electrons. So let's see what happens when they form a covalent bond. Ah, there it is. <clears throat> they share those electrons once again, and we form something that we call a hydroxide. It's, you can say OH for short. There we go. So that's a covalent bond. Now let's look at ionic. 
So what I got here is a sodium atom and a chlorine atom, and they're about to form an ionic bond. Let's watch what happens with their valence electrons when this occurs. Okay, so I got them right next to each other. Whoa, what was that? Hold on. Okay, so I got them right next to each other. See some wiggling. Whoa! And then it just, it just jumps from the sodium to the chlorine. And then that whole outer shell just disappears. <clears throat> okay, let's skip ahead a little bit and see what happens as a result of that. Now this chlorine has 18 electrons. It's negatively charged. This sodium has too few electrons. It should have 11 and it only has 10. So it becomes positively charged. eventually. <clears throat> so now we have a negative and a positive, and you know what they say about opposites. They attract. So they come together, and that force of attraction forms an ionic bond. How did that happen again? Through transferring an electron from one atom to another. But the long and short of it, the thing you need to know is that for covalent bonds, they share their electrons, and for ionic, they transfer an electron from one atom to another. So now let's answer this last question. Why do chemical bonds form? Well, for reasons beyond the scope of this class that have to do with electrostatic attraction and all sorts of other fancy pants words, Atoms like having a full outer shell of electrons. And if you haven't caught on yet, that usually means that they like to have eight of them outside, except for hydrogen and helium, they like two. Because they usually like to have eight, we call this the octet rule. So the octet rule states that atoms bond so they can have eight valence electrons. Basically, if they can trade electrons or share them in order to get eight, they'll do it. Except for hydrogen, it's an exception, it only likes to have two. <clears throat> now you might recall that there is a whole group of elements on the periodic table which has eight already. We call those the noble gases. They're called noble because they don't like to interact with any of the other peasants on the periodic table. You will be very hard-pressed to see a noble gas inside of a compound. They do not like to form bonds at all. And it makes sense. They already have eight valence electrons. They have no reason to share or trade with anybody. The way that I think about the octet rule is I just try to think of any atom that can fit into a compound as being pretty much like Simba. They just can't wait to be king. By that I mean that they can't wait to bond with other atoms so that they can have the same number of electrons as one of these noble gases in group 18. So for instance, I've got this carbon atom here, and it has four valence electrons. It wants to have eight of them. So if I drew that like so, you could see... that I would need four. Where is carbon going to get those extra electrons? Well, from other atoms. Electrons aren't usually floating around in space, they're attached to other atoms. So if carbon wants to get all eight electrons that it needs to be a king, then it's going to have to share its electrons covalently or have them transferred onto it ionically in order to get them. Which brings us to the next step in this learning process. We need to learn how to draw these compounds. Believe it or not, chemistry is a pretty visual field, and one of the big ways that we communicate is by drawing the structure of a molecule or ionic compound so that we can clearly see what it looks like when all the atoms are bonded together. We're going to start with just covalent compounds today, and next week we'll move into ionic. But for now, let's look at one of my favorite covalent compounds, and also, I'm sure, one of yours.
We're going to learn how to draw delicious, life-saving water today. That's right. We're going to learn to draw a water molecule using Lewis dot diagrams. Oh, God. We got to know about dot diagrams, too? I already forgot this, Mr. Cruz. Well, random student, if you haven't caught on yet, physical science kind of builds on itself. If you don't learn one skill, it becomes harder to learn the next one. So if you're struggling in any particular topic, it might be helpful to just take a look back every now and again at what you did before and refresh your memory so that you can do well on this next unit. Let's draw a water molecule. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at this formula here to figure out how many actual atoms we need. Uh, this 2 right here means that there's two H's. And this O doesn't have anything, so there's just one of them. So I've got... One O and two H's. And then what I'm going to do, whoops. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out where, what my, what the atom in the middle is going to be. And it's pretty easy to figure out. It's the one that you have the least amount of. So if I've got one oxygen and two hydrogens, oxygen's going in the middle. <clears throat> so now I'm just going to draw the dot diagram for or for oxygen. So let's see, oxygen has, let me count across, one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. Told you you'd need that skill. So let's go ahead and draw six valence electrons around oxygen. And remember, I go around once, and then I go around again for the next set of electrons. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so not perfect, but serviceable. <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is everywhere that I don't have a paired up set of electrons, I'm going to put another atom. So I've got these paired up, and I've got these paired up, but this one's by itself on the bottom, and this one's by itself on the side. So I'm going to take this hydrogen and put it right there. And I'm going to put this one, and I'm going to put it right here. Okay, so now I'm just going to draw the dot diagram for hydrogen. So let's take a look at this. Uh, I know, because it's in group one, that hydrogen just has one. I'm going to put it right there next to that electron from oxygen, because they share that one. I'm going to put it right there. And there we go. That is your Lewis dot diagram for water. Now, most people will then erase these electrons and draw a line instead to show that there is a bond. And it's understood that a covalent bond is two electrons being shared, so that line represents two electrons. Let's take a look at another example with some things that have a few more electrons. Okay, so this is called carbon tetrabromide and it is a carbon and four bromine atoms i know that there are four bromine atoms because because it has this little tiny four at the at the right of it <clears throat> so i know that i need one carbon and i need four bromines one two ah go away three and four Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to take this carbon, and I'm going to draw my Lewis dot structure around it, uh, my dot diagram. How many valence electrons does carbon have? One, two, three, four. Ah, it has four of them, so I'll draw one, two, three, and four. There we go. Okay. Now, just like before, I put my bromines around it. You might ask, how did I know that carbon was going to go in the middle? Well, it's because it's the one I've got the least amount of. I've only got one of them. So I put it in the middle. Put that bromine there. Put that bromine there. Okay, so now I just need to draw the dot diagram for each of these around the carbon. So let's figure out how many valence electrons bromine has. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bromine's right there in group 17. So let me draw, I'll start with the one in the bond. 
one and do the top one. Two, three, four. Oh, and I've already got two there, so I'll skip it and go five, six, seven. There we go. Okay, so now we have our Lewis diagram for bromine. Let's do the rest of these pretty quickly. So I went ahead and filled this in. This is the full carbon tetrabromide Lewis structure. And there's a few things that I want to note here. Uh, for instance, if I highlight these, these were the electrons that carbon shared. And these are the electrons that bromine shares. And you can see how every bond has two electrons inside of it. One on top, one on each side, and one on the bottom. Another thing that you'll notice is that because they shared them, everybody has eight electrons around them. Bromine had seven, well carbon shared one of his, and now bromine has eight. Each bromine has eight around it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> carbon had four, but then four bromines gave uh, an electron each. So now it has eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so now let's clean this up. All right, so this is what it looks like all cleaned up. I erased the electrons that form the bond and I drew a little line instead to show that that bond is there. This is the kind of work that I would expect you to turn in. You've got all your valence electrons, they're paired up like this and then you have your lines to show the bonds. So now that you've seen me do some of this, go ahead and get some practice yourself by doing the activities in Google Classroom. Remember, if you're Learn From Home, you'll do four out of five activities, uh, but if you're one of my AB kids in school, you'll do three out of five activities because we do some stuff in class. Uh, and remember to like and subscribe and click that bell and check out today's sponsor, Mary Curie. Mary Curie was a Polish-French physicist known for her work in radioactivity. Notably, she discovered two elements, polonium and radium. She is the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person and only woman to win the Nobel Prize twice, and the only person to win the Nobel Prize in two scientific fields. Her lab notebooks are still radioactive today, and that is a fact. Thank you very much to Mary Curie for sponsoring this video. I will see you guys next week.